All right, so it's going to be a review of the Islamic art from unit seven and some from other units. So we're going to start with the basin and we're going to be talking about how or why context influences artistic decisions. So the surfaces, so focus on the surface of this basin. This is completely decorated with friezes of figures such as Mamluk officials and dignitaries, as well as animals, fantastic creatures and coats of arms. Such designs indicate that the work was intended for a courtly secular audience. So what we need to recognize is that some artworks from the Islamic unit are going to be used for religious purposes, and then some are going to be used for secular, which means non-religious purposes or functions. So the next one, the Umayyad, of, the Umayyad Pixis of Al-Mugira is a royal vessel decorated with princely iconography, such as hunting, horseback riding, and date picking, griffins, peacocks, lions, and other animals, along with an Arabic inscription of blessing also appear. So the Arabic inscription is all along the top, but it has all of these animals and courtly figures and people picking dates off of trees. It's all um, iconographic. It represents something. So the richly detailed imagery of court life, flora and fauna, and mythological creatures is reminiscent of the scenes shown on the basin. So these two can be easily relatable together. They also have these in common. They're both vessels. The basin was later used to baptize in, I think, the French um, royal, for French royalty, that was a later function, whereas the Pixis of Al Mugira actually held like um, fragrances. And so there's negative space. This is carved into ivory, so the fragrances will be able to um, be easily smelled, smelled, so it, it would come out of the negative spaces. Uh, Islamic examples of figures and animals and artwork, that means it's secular, non religious. They both have Arabic inscriptions and they both have action happening or an emphasis in the roundels or the medallions. So this one, you can see it. And there's four of them all around on both sides. And then you could also talk about this concept of horror vacui, that fear of leaving empty space, which we saw with the Roman battle, um, battle sarcophagus, Ludovici battle sarcophagus. All right, so here's other examples of secular artworks in the Islamic uh, tradition. So these aren't all from Unit 7, but these are all considered Islamic. So they uh, have the Alhambra Palace, which is in Spain. It's in Granada, Spain. And you have the Court of the Lions. So you actually have lions that's holding up that fountain. And fountains and water is really important in Islamic art. It represents paradise. Then we have the Court of Guyomars. And, well, it's not both the same thing. So the Court of Guyomars is on the bottom right. And then this is Baramgur, Baramgur fights a karg. Baramgur fights a karg. And the karg is the animal that's been decapitated on the bottom. And then the Pixis of Almugira and then the basin. So these all have figures or animals. So they are not for religious purposes. All right, the Artabil carpet. Um, features complex patterns that were created by knotting differently colored pieces of yarn onto the underlying vertically positioned warp threads. So here's like a action shot. You have the warp, the vertical threads, and then you have someone tying knots of threads going along horizontally. So you have the, the warp and the weft. So this is continuing the tradition of Persian uh, fiber arts, Persian carpet making tradition. So the more knots that these carpets would have, that means the more detailed and more elaborate the patterns would be. And that would also mean the higher value of the carpet. Much like today, if you're ever buying sheets, the higher the thread count, the more expensive the sheet, the nicer the fabric. So it also ties into this tradition of carpet making. So I have a children's book that focuses on Islamic art, and it says, red is the rug dad kneels on to pray, facing toward Mecca five times a day. And that's an important part of Islamic life is praying five times a day, and they would kneel, you know, on their knees on these prayer rugs. And this is a great piece to talk about um, what is considered beautiful in Islamic art. So since this work was created for a mosque, there are no figural design elements. This is considered aniconic. 
So if we compare all three of these three carpets that are all made during the same dynasty, the Safavid dynasty, these carpets can be attributed to the Safavid dynasty because of its use of a centralized medallion motif, very typical of Safavid carpets. They all have the central medallion. They're all very symmetrical. That it represents beauty in Islamic art, having harmony and symmetry. Um, having these intricate, complicated patterns, and you can call these arabesque patterns because it's all floral, vegetal, calligraphy inspired, swirly, curvy type of lines. The Artabil carpet also has on either side of that central medallion, it has two lamps, which would be hanging down from the, uh, hanging down in a mosque. Blank one. All right, the Kaaba. So the Kaaba is considered to be the holiest of all Islamic sites. According to the five principles of Islamic faith or the five pillars of Islam, all Muslims are expected to undertake the Hajj. So that's the fifth pillar of Islam. The Hajj is a pilgrimage to Mecca to visit the Kaaba at least once in their lifetime if they are able. As part of the rituals connected to the Hajj, pilgrims or Muslims when they come to the site, they circumambulate which means walk around the Kaaba multiple times. You gotta keep them circumambulating. Dun, 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 dun. All right, following the original example of the prophet Muhammad. Given the large size of the crowds, so these are other photos that the college board wants us to recognize, showing us the size of the crowds. It's not just showing us the Kaaba, it's giving us that whole space. So given the large size of the crowds who undertake the pilgrimage annually, it is important to provide enough space around the Kaaba for this important ritual to take place. After the Prophet Muhammad had introduced Islam to Mecca, a mosque, which is now the Great Mosque of Mecca, this whole space, you can see the minarets, right, all the space around Kaaba, was built around the Kaaba, and over the course of the centuries, it was enlarged several times. In its current layout, the architects have included a wide courtyard that surrounds the Kaaba, which is situated in its center, in order to accommodate the large crowds of pilgrims circumambulating this holy shrine. You gotta keep them circumambulating. Do, 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 do. All right, and this is basically what I just said. World's largest and holiest mosque. Um, the Qibla is the direction all Muslims face when praying. All right, Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. Okay, so Muslims at the time that this was built would have recognized this being built in this sacred place, meaning to recognize the triumph of the new faith of Islam through the structure's symbolic location at a sacred religious site. This site is important for several different faiths. Therefore, the Dome of the Rock's construction in this location as a site of Islamic worship is a physical manifestation of the religion's triumph over the Jewish and Christian faiths. So this marked the coming of the new religion to a city that was and is sacred to both Jews and Christians. The reasons it's sacred to the different religions, it's built right on the site of the Temple of Solomon. That was the Jewish temple that was destroyed a couple times. It was destroyed and then rebuilt and then again destroyed by the Romans. So if you ever hear about the Western Wall, those are the remnants left of the Temple of Solomon. So the Muslims had taken the city from the Byzantines, hence the gold, look at that gold. Um, and then this was erected as a shrine, not a mosque, not a mosque, as a tribute to the triumph of Islam. So a couple other reasons why it's important to all three religions. It's where Abraham offered Isaac for sacrifice. That's that biblical story of him sacrificing his son and then God or an angel comes down and says, wait, don't do it. So it happened there. It's where Adam, the first man is buried. And it's the place where Muhammad ascended to heaven, accompanied by the angel Gabriel, and in the same night returned to his home in Mecca. So that's the story called the night journey. And that is in the Quran. Um, remember I said the Muslims had taken the city from the Byzantine, hence all the gold. So if we go look inside, this is the floor, that's the rock. It is a dome over a rock. So then it has all of these columns or piers, and then it has all of the arches going around. It has an ambulatory where you would walk around. An ambulatory is an aisle that goes around. 
And then again, looking inside, we see lots of gold. This is actually gold mosaics. And on the outside, you have blue and green glazed tile mosaics. You're seeing all of the arabesque patterns. That's the calligraphy, the swirling lines, the floral, the vegetal patterns, complicated, intricate. And then you can relate again, the gold, the gold mosaics relate to Byzantine. So it links together. So the Dome of the Rock was, the Dome of the Rock emphasizes the rock. Where's that rock? There's the rock. The Dome of the Rock emphasizes the rock at its center to commemorate, to remember the place which Muhammad is believed to have started his night journey. Um, and then I have written down the Dome of the Rock's decorative program, that means the, the decorations, includes an extensive use of mosaics. Many Byzantine churches, such as the San Vitale in Ravenna from the 6th century, included elaborate mosaics. So here's a question that's come up several times throughout architecture that we've covered um, in different units. How does architecture reflect the changing societies that's going on at that time, right? So we can relate this to the Hagia, so Hagia Sophia. This was created as a Byzantine church. It then the Ottomans came and then conquered. So you have those Ottoman pencil minarets. It is then became an Ottoman mosque. Then it was later changed into a museum. And then just last summer turned back into a mosque. So how can we relate this to the great mosque of Cordoba? This is in Spain. Spain, the Umayyad, that's the first Muslim dynasty. Um, there's your dates. So I got this from one of our students' note pages. I love how she wrote this out. So this first started as a Roman temple, right? So you have the Romans in rule in this land. Then they are conquered by the Visigoths, and that Roman temple is converted or changed or transformed into a church. Then we have the conquering Muslims, so they're going to change it into a mosque. And now what the heck is going on right in the center, right? You can see a transept. You can see the letter T, and then it has a dome on top. So that is a cathedral that has then been added by the later conquering culture that came in. So we're going to see spolia. Spolia is recycling elements from older build buildings reused for new construction. So the Great Mosque of Cordoba was built on the site of a previous church and included recycled ancient columns. So these columns are Roman columns and other elements from Roman and Visigoth structures. And then if we are looking at the mirab, so the mirab is that empty niche um, that tells Muslims, the Qibla, the way to face, which is typically towards Mecca, except for this one, which actually points towards Damascus, which relates to the context. Um, so this is on the Qibla wall. But again, we're seeing all of that Islamic um, decorative program. So the entire surface here is covered in mosaics in gold and blue, because this was also created during the Byzantine Empire, and those are the materials that artists are working with at that time. You have that intricate cal cal calligraphy, calligraphic bands. So you can see right here the calligraphy. It's probably Kufic, which is like script for Arabic. Vegetal motifs, so those swirling lines, you can call them vegetal, floral, arabesque, intricate, complicated patterns. And then you have that horseshoe arched mirab. So again, we need to be able to identify the different parts of a mosque. So like I said, the mirab is that empty niche. You can even relate that to the Kaaba, which when uh, Muhammad came from Medina back to Mecca and he had his Islamic followers. They took all of the idols out of the Kaaba. They emptied the Kaaba. Um, and so that's that empty niche. And then that tells, it keeps wanting to say students, it tells Muslims the way to face, which is the Qibla, the direction. And then it's on the Qibla wall. And then the most important furniture, really the only furniture that I know of that's going to be inside of a mosque is the minbar. Um, this one is kind of shaped like a platform. I've seen them also shaped kind of triangular, which is just a staircase going up. So that's going to be where you're going to have someone reciting or chanting the Quran. You have prayer mats in your prayer hall. You might have a dome above you in the prayer hall, maybe. Um, there's going to be a courtyard. There's going to be a washing area with a fountain because that's part of the rituals to wash before we pray. And then the minarets are those tall towers where they're going to have a muezzin, M-U-E-Z-Z-I-N, someone who is going to be calling everybody to pray five times a day. 
All right, and then this is the floor plan of the Great Mosque of Cordoba. So again, we have all those features that I just talked about that's kind of laid out. And we need to be able to recognize what all those dots are. Those are columns. If you have a forest of columns, that's going to be a hypo style hall right here. So Muhammad's house, here's a drawing. We don't actually have a picture of his house. Muhammad's house in Medina inspired this early type of mosque, which is called a hypo style hall. So his house had a columned thatched roof and then a courtyard. So the earliest type of mosque has a hall of columns, the hypo style hall and a courtyard. And then here's an exterior view where again, you can see the Islamic decorative program being continued. Plus we have all these different types of arches that we need to know. We have these overlapping arches, which creates a three point arch. Those are up here. So when they overlap, it creates the three pointed arch. You have the lobed arch and then you have the horseshoe arch. So these three types of arches are really um, characteristic of Islamic architecture. And some of this was also here part of the Visigoth architecture that when again they came in, the Muslims came in and conquered, they kind of adapted this into their own visual language. All right, then we got the Great Mosque of Isfahan, which is in Iran. Okay, so what parts of the mosque that we just talked about can you recognize here? So we have a courtyard, this big empty space. Um, and according to traditional design of congregational mosques, where everybody congregates and comes together, the courtyard in the Great Mosque of Isfahan was built on such a large scale in order to make sure that the mosque could accommodate the city's entire adult male population during Friday prayers. Also, we can recognize that piece of furniture I talked about, the minbar. This is what someone would be standing up on when they are reciting or chanting the Quran. So what's different about this mosque compared to the Great Mosque of Cordoba is the, the layout, the ground plan. So here's the plan of it. So it still has hypo style halls, right? So it still has all of these columns. And this actually started as a hypo style mosque, but it has now been altered over time and it has these Ewans. So this is an Ewan style mosque. But if you have these Ewans, how do we know which way to pray when we are praying, when Muslims are praying five times a day? So the presence of two minarets, let me go back. Here's our two minarets. The presence of two minarets or towers used to call the faithful to prayer above one of the four Ewans in the courtyard of the Great Mosque of Isfahan reminds worshipers of the need to position themselves toward the city of Mecca as they pray. So these minarets um, are indicating which way Muslims would face. So inside these Ewans, again, we can see really typical Islamic architecture with that three pointed arch. And then we're also seeing this, it looks like, um, like a beehive sort of texture or um, stalagmite and caves sort of texture. And these are called makarnas. I was thinking of the Macarena. It's the only way I can remember it. So the makarnas is just a part of the decorative program of Islamic architecture. And you can see larger makarnas in here. All right, the Mosque of Selim II, which is in Turkey. The name of the architect is Sinan or Sinan the Great. Um, so we've got those tall, skinny minarets, and those are very characteristic of Ottoman architecture. And then on the right, you have a view of the inside. It looks just like the Dome of the Rock, except there's not a rock in the center. That's a big difference of what it looks like. But it has the alternating bricks, like the different colors that we also saw in Cordoba, and we saw in the Dome of the Rock, and those are called voussoirs, just the alternating colors of bricks. We can see the clear story windows all along the Dome of the Drum the drum of the dome, sorry. If you look in the top of the inside of the dome, it almost looks like that same central medallion that we saw on the Artabil carpet, right? You have calligraphy, um, it is radial symmetry, you have arabesque, complicated, intricate, floral, vegetal patterns, all of that jazz, all the same stuff that we've been talking about. All right, so the ground plan, 
we still have the function, the, the elements of a mosque. You have the mirab, and that is on the Qibla wall. And the Qibla tells you the direction to pray, which is toward Mecca. You're going to have a prayer hall. You're going to have a courtyard. Um, so this is really influenced by the Hagia Sophia. So the Hagia Sophia plan is on the left. So Sinan's goal was to make this bigger and better than the Hagia Sophia. So Sinan created a centrally planned mosque. So we have a hypostyle mosque, we have a four Ewan mosque, and then we have a centrally planned mosque. This surpassed the height of Hagia Sophia. Um, the Sinan, I should say Sinan, adapted the central plan of Hagia Sophia and then changed it to meet the requirements of Islamic religious practice, like having a mirab, which is visible from any location inside the mosque. Again, those pencil minarets are very characteristic of Ottoman architecture. And then this was built on the tallest point in the city, located on the tallest hill overlooking the city. And if you come to the city, it's the first thing that you see. So it's appearing larger and it visually symbolizes the Islamic dominance over Christianity. And again, here's a view of the inside and then comparing it to the Dome of the Rock, which is covered in gold for Byzantine. It has a rock. So those are some of the differences between the two. All right, so we have one illuminated manuscript that is all calligraphy, and this is a folio, so a folio means a page from a Quran. All right, so that's what we're looking at. So we need to know what the red kind of circles are. What are these stacked circles here? We know this is Arabic, but it's a certain type of Arabic. So this part here that I just highlighted, this gold, is telling us the title of the chapter. So what the chapters are called in the Quran are surahs. And then those piles of triangles, um, triangular stacked golden circles indicate the end of each verse. The red dots indicate a vowel sound. So there's no vowels in Arabic. And so those dots would then tell the reader how to pronounce that word. So this is all written in Kufic. So Kufic is the calligraphic style of Arabic text. I kind of think of it as like script right? Uh, cursive, like how we write in cursive. So it's the stylized angular calligraphy of the Arabic text. It's called Kufic. The red, green, and gold marks help visually assist the reader with the recitation um, of the Quran. So it's something that would be kind of memorized, and then it would be chanted, and this would help the reader orally recite the Quran. So calligraphy is really important. So these are ideas we need to remember. To make beautiful the word of God as an act of worship, that's why calligraphy is the most important art form in Islamic religious art. We're even seeing it in secular art pieces, the calligraphy that's on there. All right, Buddha. So I call these Buddhas the Bamiyan Buddhas, and in this Buddha is lo was located in Bamiyan in Afghanistan, and this is there's two, right, two really large ones that are now empty niches that were carved right into the rock wall, into the cave. All right, so that's a picture of one of the two. So some main ideas we need to remember, the cultural connections fostered by the location of this in Bamiyan. Um, it's along the Silk Road where lots of different um, traveling nomadic cultures and groups are going through the same area. So while they're meeting and talking, they are also exchanging ideas and religions. Um, and you're seeing this in the art on the, along the Silk Road. So this is reflected, the Bamiyan location on the Silk Road are reflected in the realistically draping folds of the robes influenced by Hellenistic Greek style. The drapery found on the works closely resembles that of the, wing, the victory adjusting her sandal from the Acropolis. That's what I have on the right. The winged victory of Samothrace or reliefs from the great altar of Zeus. Um, we're also seeing an influence from India with them traveling through India and then bringing with them Buddhism. And that's how we get Buddhism to travel across Asia. And then Greek art with Hellenistic traditions. Um, also, it's hard to see here, but it's actually caved or caved. It's carved around the feet so that when you were to go to this Buddha, you could go around them and you could circumambulate. You got to keep them circumambulating, um, which means the act of walking around an object, which is a common practice in Buddhist and Islamic worship. Ambulatories were carved around the feet to accommodate circumambulation. 
An ambulatory is a place for walking. The Dome of the Rock has an ambulatory around it. San Vitale in Ravenna has an ambulatory around it. And the Bamayan Buddha has an ambulatory around it. All right, so the Taliban blew these up, I want to say in the year 2001, which is an act of iconoclasm. We talked about this with the Byzantine time period, lots of images of idols, right? Um, depictions of people that people would be worshiping were destroyed. So this is the rejection or destruction of religious images um, as heretical. So it's the idea of not of false worship. We don't want to be worshiping these false idols. All right, that is your review. You're going to do great on this test. I know it. I can feel it. <laughs>